So let me to talk about one, one more thing that is important. One more operator, Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian basically describes the total energy. So Hamiltonian operator is kinetic energy operator plus potential energy operator. Okay? And if you want to write it as a function, uh, as an operator, you can... So kinetic part is this one, potential part is this one. So far so good? Now, if you get the Schrodinger equation from above and put it down here, you will notice something. So copy. There's always in physics this kind of wisdom where an equation gets zipped down to simpler ideas. So notice that this can be written as i h bar del psi over del t is equal to h times psi. Because this thing is operating on phi over here. Do you, do you see that? Yeah. Does everyone see that? Yes, good. So. <coughs> If you think of it as vector, matrix, vector kind of thing, then you can say that psi vector at t is basically e to the, do you remember this trick? h bar over i h bar t is actually a matrix. Do you remember? Like taking a matrix to the exponential. This is basically how Schrodinger equation works. So I give you a, as a vector psi zero, and it uses this e to the thing. And this is really, really called time evolution operator. OK? So <coughs> let's look at some codes. Now, we are in this part where we called it Schrodinger equation part. So there is a calculation part, and there is some length. So all lengths are written in, yes? Yes, of course. Yes. Initial value is the initial state of the system. So the state of the system, we are talking about one particle. And normally, one particle would have a position and a momentum. Okay? And we would know what it will do later on. In quantum mechanics, we throw it away. We say that one particle has a wave function. And wave function has all the answers to our questions within it, hidden somehow. And if I start with a certain wave function, Schrodinger equation tells me what will happen to that wave function later on, at a later stage. It's like Newton's equation, but in quantum world. Because Newton's equations, F equals to MA, tells you that if there is a force acting on the object, it will accelerate. Right? And acceleration is force divided by m. What is force? Negative gradient of the potential. Now, Schrodinger equation tells you that if you have a potential profile, like it could be a harmonic oscillator or zero potential, so nothing is happening to the particle. If it's, uh, that's uh, Newton's first law. If it's moving, it will keep moving, right? No force. Yes, tell me. What's the question? Ah. Yeah. No, 
No, that's the point. Measurement makes the wave function collapse and erases the memory. Okay. Erases the past. That's why, if you remember, we had in Stöngerlach the problem that even though you have actually measured it to be up z here, that memory is erased by this measurement. Yes. Very good point, very good point. You are telling me that sh quantum mechanics is schizophrenic. That's what you are telling me. Because it acts differently. If I don't measure, it obeys to Schrodinger's equation. If I measure, it stops obeying Schrodinger's equation. It obeys to wave function collapse idea. That's a big problem. People, some, there are some people who say, let's shut up and calculate because it works. They actually do uh, say that. And there are others who say that we have a schizophrenic theory. Let's figure it out, why it's like that. And nobody, well, there are super smart people working on that. They should. But like vast amount of people don't care. OK? But it's, it's good that you do care. But so far, on that side, uh, they, I'm sorry to say this, but they never won a battle. Like, uh, that's the hidden variables and like, quantum mechanics is not complete side. The, let's say, call it Einstein side. Einstein contributed to quantum mechanics immensely. Without him, it wouldn't be at this stage. He understood and accepted Planck's h bar omega even before he, ac he accepted it. He was still saying that it's still unexplained something, but Einstein took it and explained photoelectric effect with it. Nevertheless, Einstein had your uh, doubts. The doubts that you are having that the theory doesn't fit to our usual understandings of natural theories, whereby you have no dice thrown by anyone, right? But it seems like once you do the measurement, the whole universe stops working according to Schrodinger equation, and it's just, they just wait for you to ask your question, and it answers your question. Yeah. OK, good. Very good. I, I'm sorry, I'm still uh, uh, over there. Let me add one thing, one more thing. Oh, is it okay? Once you start adding up particles, like not just one particle, but many body physics, okay, then you start sort of seeing what's going on. Uh, So-called many worlds interpretation. So what I am telling you is Copenhagen interpretation, okay? Uh, and it's schizophrenic. But there is another interpretation, which is many worlds interpretation. They don't change anything in terms of calculations, just how do, should we understand it, okay? When it comes to many worlds interpretation, uh, it's very hard to really grasp it, but uh, it's sort of a smooth way of thinking about it, and according to many worlds, no collapse happens. Uh, <laughs> what happens is that, what was your name? Furkan. Furkan looks at Schrodinger's cat, okay? Furkan sees a dead cat. That Furkan lives in one branch of the many body wave function, and Furkan that found it alive lives on another branch of many, world, uh, many body wave function, and they never interact. In, uh, that's the explanation. So there's no collapse. Okay, yes. I'm still with him. <laughs> <laughs> you get entangled with the cat. Uh, you get into an entangled state with the cat. No. <laughs> yes, tell me. The time evolution that you wrote below, right? The time evolution operator. Yes. Size zero. Yes. Is there a, like in the mean time of these measurements in Stangella? 
But is it the reason the measurement is changing from one measurement to other one? Let's come back to this question. This is a very important question. And it, it really depends on the operator. OK? So let's look at this code. So you have length, which is defined in angstrom. You have time, which is in femtoseconds. You have energy in electron volt. OK? Then according to these units, h bar is 0 0.658. Comes out a nice number. And according to this, units, mass of electron is 0 0.057, okay? So I take an, a box of length L. I have some grid on the box, and I define X. Then I define this kinetic energy, um, let me call it term or whatever. I will use it in the definition of the Hamilton matrix. This is something that I will explain later maybe. So I start with Hamiltonian momentum operator position operator. How does Hamiltonian look like? It's just minus two, one, one kind of thing. Just like I said, it's second order derivative multiplied by that h bar squared over two m delta x. So far so good? Then there are momentum and position, especially position is important. It turns out that position operator is just the values of the position written at the diagonals, okay? And I will come back to the position operator. Um, that's because we are taking the beta shift position basis, right? Exactly, exactly. Brilliant. Very good. Thank you very much. Quantum time evolution operator, yes? I start with initial condition, which is a sine of 2 pi and sine of pi. It's a combination of energy being at E1 and energy being at E2, okay? Just trust me with that. Then I have update function, which is nothing but dot product of U times F, okay? And then I have the measurement, the wave function. So you see that schizophrenic quality is even present in my code. There's a part which corresponds to updating the wave function which obeys the Schrodinger equation. And then there is wave function collapse part. When it comes to wave function collapse, that's where you throw die. This is where you throw dice. Throw dice. Okay? And according to what comes out of the dice, you basically get collapsed into C1 squared, C2 squared, do you understand C1 squared, C2 squared? It's the probability of collapsing into first one, second one, third one, etc. And all that calculation is here. Just trust me. Let's run it and get over with it. Uh, like, oops. Yeah. Mm. Isn't it nice? So x is x, like position. And then I have a particle in a box, OK? The edges are kept at 0. And it's a combination of the first energy state and the second energy state. So far, so good? Now, remember, or don't remember because I didn't show it, but let me show you. Uh, where is my? Ah, wave function collapse. Do you see that there is an operator here, Q? And basically, it gets its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So it can be any operator. And then we, if we go down here, I have, if I press E, if I press E, let me just extend it. If I press E, I measure energy. And in that case, my Q becomes H. So measuring energy means that the operator is H. Measuring position means that the operator is P, etc. right? So while I'm here, let me press E. Do you see? It collapsed into the first eigenstate. And if I measure energy again, I will still get E1. 
But this is special, this is specific to energy that once you measure energy, uh, it stays the same. I mean, for position, for position, if you measure position, it comes out here. If you me measure it, like, as soon as possible, it will be close by, okay? But if you take some time to measure it, then it can diffuse. And you can find particles somewhere else, okay? But not with energy. If your potential doesn't depend on time, your energy is, simply put, the energy is conserved. Do you see the point here? So let's restore the wave function. You see, if I put R, if I press R, it resets the wave function, which is not natural, okay? This cannot happen in nature. So let's reset the wave function. And let's measure energy again. Again, the first energy. Let's reset again. Let's measure again. First one, reset, measure. First one, reset, measure. Second one. Uh, I mean, uh, there, there was a dice and it came out four times. The first, E1, but we actually have a previous video of it. Uh, it's not on YouTube, though. We are playing this game, and someone guesses it nine times. Uh, unbelievably. Yes, but, yeah, re reset it. Uh, what I was going to do, measure energy, second one. Reset it, measure energy, first one. So hopefully this code gives you an idea of how Schrodinger's equation works and how wave function collapse works. This is how nature works. Like it, leave it be, it obeys Schrodinger's equation. Ask a question, it freezes and answers your question and just changes its whole reality according to your question. It is as if, oh, I spoke too much. It is as if you have uh, what, what do you call that large spoon with a lot of holes in it? Stainer. Hmm? Stainer. Stainer? Siever? Yeah. Whatever. I, I mean, something that has a lot of holes in it. And you basic, your question basically tells you that uh, you can be any kind of a dough, but on this side you have to come out of one of those parts as a needle. Okay, you are not allowed, like, because that's my answer to the question. So it has to come out from the other side, <laughs> obeying to that thing. Yeah, very good. Okay. But what's the initial state that's being given? The initial state, uh, let me stop this. Oh. The initial state is a combination of sign. Uh, so you don't know this. Many of you don't know this. But what we just did was this, 0 to L, right? And your, if you do certain calculations, your first energy is, looks like this one, just like you saw. And it corresponds to square root 2 over L sine. Uh, pi over Lx, okay? And if you measure the second energy, then it collapses into 2 over L sine 2 pi over Lx, okay? And it looks like this. And this one is R squared pi squared over 2 ma squared. This one is 2 h bar squared pi squared over ma squared, whatever, right? I mean, this is, if this is 1, this is 4. And that's what we get, actually. I'm also printing the energy. So wh when I got 1, uh, E1, I got 1. When I got E2, I got 4. So everything works out. OK? OK. <laughs> What? Ah, L, L, yes. Yes, uh, I'm used to writing it with A. 
I didn't derive it. I mean, it's something called time independent Schrodinger equation because you can do stuff here, whatever. Okay? I have it in the notes, uh, but you are too bored today. So I want to do a bit more fun stuff. We, will, we can come back to time independent Schrodinger equation next time. Now, what is the fun stuff? The fun stuff is Fourier transform. <laughs> Oh my God. I will come to your question. Yes. Yes. Uh, it, it becomes delta function and it moves. Yes, 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 exactly. So since you understand it, I will run it. But uh, it's a mess. So if I press X, okay, it will collapse into a needle. And since needle has lots of sines and cosines, it will just go crazy. Ready? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it's a bad, badly written code. I, I will fix it. Don't worry. Momentum, also like that. But it's it's a bit good. I had a mi uh, MATLAB version that was working much better. But if you put X and then measure energy, then you get high energies because you have collapsed it into a needle, right? Whatever. If I measure energy again, it keeps coming. Uh, uh, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. seven. So it should be 49. And it's 49. Do you see? Seven squared. So everything works out. I mean, if you are interested, you can go and play with this code. <laughs> ah, you have a question. No, no. The green color is very good question. The green color is absolute values, absolute value of the wave function. So it's. Yeah, and it stops, right? Look, look. Why? So the thing is that this is the, let's say this is the real part, this is the imaginary part. And it's like a vector that goes like this, OK? But the absolute value of that vector is the same. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, I, I understand you. Believe me, I understand you. No worries. So let's come back to Fourier transform. And why we should go back to Fourier transform? Because <laughs> this is so cute. Uh, it's a Python with a joystick. <laughs> In its mouth, it doesn't have hands. <laughs> OK. Let's talk about momentum a little bit further. What I'm going to tell you is that e to the i k x is a wave function of a particle moving with momentum h bar k. So let me prove it to you. What was p? Um, h bar over i del over del x. Do you remember this yes. from today? Yes. This is uh, the operator, right? If I take this operator, operate on e to the i k x, what do I get? h bar over i times del over del x e to the i k x. What do I get? I get h bar k times e to the i k x. Do you see? Uh, so what I got is this is the eigen, eigen vector. 
this is the eigenvalue and this is the eigenvector. Do you see that? So if you take a P measurement, what comes out is those values. Now, e to the ikx, you have seen it also in the Fourier transform, right? So if I want to represent, if you remember, there was something like this. f tilde k was integral e to the minus ikx, or was it a sum, whatever. Okay, let's make it an integral. So what this was doing is taking your function and projecting it into e to the i k axis and finding out how many of each k you have, right? That way you would go from function plotted in x space like this, going to the function plotted in p space, no, k space, like this. So far, so good? Uh, the thing is that if you have a well-defined sign, then it corresponds to a sharp peak in k space, right? Because you only have one value of k within the function. But if you have something sharp here to represent that sharpness, you need to use a lot of different coefficients, right? So this tells you that if you have a sharp object, if you measure momentum, uh, anything can come out, many different values. So there is a the uncertainty in momentum measurement increases as uncertainty in position measurement decreases. D did you get this? And by the way, we teach uncertainty in high schools and it feels like it has something to do with interaction. Like you bother the system, the more you bother, the more the uncertainty, right? And we would say that to find the position in a fine way, you have to send a light that has lower wavelength, which is higher frequency, which disturbs the system too much so that the momentum becomes uncertain more. That's not the case, <laughs> okay? The uncertainty is there within its nature. If you squeeze the wave function too much, it gets expanded in the momentum space. If you squeeze it in momentum space, it gets expanded in the real space. Let me show it to you with the code. So Fourier transform, you have fx, and fk is Fourier transform of fx, right? This is just ma matrix multiplication. And if I plot them, Let's say you have a sigma of 1. So you, you are plot, we are plotting a Gaussian of sigma of 1 and comes out like this. There's a needle and then there is a huge thing in the Fourier transform. But if I increase sigma in x space, then it becomes a needle in the k space. Did you see this? Yep. How about everyone else? Is this clear? Yes, we are. Let me act like co-pilot and complete your sentence. You do go from reciprocal space to real space by inverse Fourier transform. Is, was that the question? No. <laughs> I'm a bad version then. Is? Yes, exactly. Yes. I mean, you have to multiply with h bar, but otherwise, yes. Of course you can. <laughs> do they actually do it make sense and uh, 
Well, uh, I don't really understand your question, but do you want to plot it? Ah, okay, 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 okay. Yes, 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 yes. You are basically cutting through a Gaussian. Yes, very good. So, what was your name? Sorry. Ar what Artun is suggesting is that if I... This seems like one of those uh, three blue, one brown plots, right? So you have X here, K here, and if you have something like this, right? What you are trying to say is that if I cut through here, I will see this, which will correspond to something like that, etc. I mean, uh, you can go somewhere with that, but I couldn't figure it out. At least I understood it, you partially, I guess. Yes. Good. Well, what do we do with it? We can describe a free particle with this Fourier transform. Look, this Fourier transform is centered at zero. What does it mean? It means that you are constructing this function using some plus k and some minus k, and together they make a they make a wave function, right? But then it corresponds to a particle that has zero momentum and some uncertainty in the momentum. Does it make sense? So if, if you look at that particle, it will uh, basically stay in place and just, just go away like this, okay? It will not move in a certain direction. However, if you put some k0, and describe Gaussian as k minus k0, and this time I'm putting sigma in the reciprocal space. Okay, so for example, putting it at k equals to 1 and making it there, you will create something like this, okay? And this will be our wave function, and it will go to the right once Schrodinger equation runs. Are you ready for it? Did you understand this? First of all, yes or no? No? So before I was constructing a function from a Gaussian centered at k equals to zero. Now I'm constructing a function from coefficients that are centered around k equals to one. Ah, by the way, none of this will be in the homework. J just relax, okay, chill out. Uh, k equals to 1, so this wave function is mostly constructed f with the coefficients that correspond to h bar k, where h bar k is positive. So it will go to the right. Ready? Ah, okay, I went straight ahead to tunneling. So let me put the tunneling potential to zero so that it won't get tunneled. So this is just free particle going to the right. K0 is 1. I start from minus 50. And how do I go to minus 50? I just roll, roll the function to the minus 50. You see, everything is connected. OK. Where is, do you see the particle nicely going to the right? Let me reset it. It started like this, and it's going to the right. Reset it. I can make it go slower. I can make it go faster just by increasing uh, the number of times. But are you convinced that it is going to the right? Well, let me interrupt this and make it go to the left. So long. Yeah. Make it go to the land, uh, left, and let's start from plus 50. It's a function that starts at the right and goes to the left. Everyone is happy, right? Who is unhappy here? It's, it's because it's slow, right? 
it's dispersing very slowly. That's a very good point. Why it's dispersing? Because, uh, oh, this is also nice. It will be, since it's in a box, it will bounce back. Nice. And it's even more dispersed, right? Why? Because it's not just constructed from 1K. It has several Ks, right? So basically, it's one particle that has many velocities. What was your name? The measurement schizophrenia? Hmm? Furkan. Furkan, Furkan. Do you see, like, before good old days, we have position and momentum. Now one particle has many positions and many momenta. So it's weird. Are you happy? Good. Now let's do tunneling. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. I hope you are still with me. So what I'm going to s do now, let me look at the code. Somehow it feels like I take more time that I'm actually taking, right? I mean, the lecture should be over by now. <laughs> but it is not over. I mean, we have 10 more minutes. It's just packed up, dense stuff. Ah, wh where am I? What I am doing? <laughs> Who am I? OK, <laughs> potential energy operator. OK, so potential energy operator is just Vx is written in diagonals, right? So I, I write zeros everywhere, except in the middle somewhere, I'm going to write 5. So what will happen? I have edges of the box, which is infinite potential. It can't expa ex escape out. But I also put a tiny bit of potential in the middle. It's actually not tiny bit. It's reasonable potential. So classically, it's like putting particle in a box and putting a bump that the particle cannot pass. So classically, the particle would start bouncing between these two edges. Quantum mechanically, <laughs> it can tunnel. It can tunnel through the barrier, and we will see it. Let's see it. So I start. On the left, I go to the right. This time I have this barrier. And look at what happens. Part of it bounces back, but part of it goes to the other side. So let me reset it and watch it slower, uh, faster. Yeah comes out, part of it actually tunnels through. Uh, this means that even if I put the particle to the left side of the box, there is going to be a significant probability of me finding the box, the, the particle on the other side of the box. Okay, it will tunnel through, although it's classically impossible. It's literally going through the wall, OK? And reappearing on the other side. Any questions, comments? Yes. No. Yes, uh, uh, I, I thought that in total, whether it loses or not. Well, I didn't talk about what the area under this plot means. So let me, exactly. Let me start talking about that. What? Ah, OK. OK. You will have the code. <laughs> let me run it faster.
I mean, it's continuous like that. Sorry. So what is that area underneath that curve, right? Well, to understand that, let's also talk about position. Now, position matrix, as I said earlier, looks like this. There's x0, x1, x2, dot, 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 and 0 everywhere else. If you remember, these kinds of matrices have special eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So if you get x, x2, for example, would have zeros everywhere except where x2 is. Okay? So it will, if you plot it, it corresponds to a needle-like function. Right? Now, what is the probability of getting x2? It's c2, which is x2 dagger wave function, right? Now, when you dagger this wave, this wave with the wave function that you have, so this is the wave function that you have, and you dagger them together, what does it pick? It picks just this value, right? So it basically picks up x2. And then c2 squared is the probability of getting that x2. So psi squared is the probability of finding a particle at a certain position, right? So when it's tunneling, what I'm plotting is absolute value of psi. If I plot absolute value squared of psi, then the area underneath corresponds to the probability of finding the particle in that region. So when it starts, it's on the left side of the room. But after some time, it, the probability of finding the particle on the left side of the room leaks to the right side of the room. OK? That's what's going on with the tunneling. Uh, uh, OK, yes? Oh, very good. I think so. It will equalize over time. That's one thing. It has significant differences, though, with what happens with the membranes and with what happens with quantum tunneling. So here's the thing. Uh, there is this thing of things can pass over the barrier classically. How? If you have enough temperature. So if you jiggle something, right, it can accidentally get a kick and get to the other side. That also goes with exponential to the minus something, right? Exponential over minus delta energy over kBT. That's the probability of something going to the other side because of thermal fluctuations, right? But this is something else. This is a particle just switching to the other side because of purely quantum mechanical effect. It has no classical analog. And uh, I'm just filling the time. We have four more minutes. Any questions? Yes, you have a question. Is the tunneling like teleporting? <laughs> no. no? It depends by direction, right? Tunneling by direction. I mean, the wave is coming back from the. Uh, yeah, yeah. Side. Yeah. Probability of going back or forth is equal. Why not? Uh, why not trans? Uh, I don't know. He said that it's not teleportation. <laughs> uh, There's no spontaneous change in um, expectation value of the um, position. It's just that um, the wave function after hitting the tunnel can still, um, after hitting the um, potential barrier, even though it should not classically be able to um, be on the other side, there's a small probability it can be on the other side. Yeah. Nevertheless, nevertheless, what we are watching is the wave function. You can never watch a wave function in reality because watching wave function means measuring it. Measuring it means ruining it, right? 
So what you can do is do lots of measurements of this event and then you will get something that fits with your mathematics but otherwise no one has ever and can ever set up a wave function measure it plot it oh this is my device that plots the wave function you can't have that device because what is it measuring what is the corresponding operator N nothing right like, so uh, it's very intriguing that after billion years of evolution, we as apes came up with something that describes nature uh, and puts the ultimate reality of nature behind the curtain. But we still can imagine it that behind the curtain there is this kind of mathematics and we accept that it will always remain behind the curtain and we will never reach to there. We are always over here. Okay, thank you very much. Let's stop here.